we tested this awesome diesel heater. We found that it was far cheaper to run than electricity and that we could theoretically burn waste oil in this. However, waste oil burning is illegal. So the most awesome thing about YouTube, which I hope you agree, is the comment section. And we have this awesome positive feedback loop where you guys tell me where I've gotten it wrong or have some better suggestions. So I heard you, I listened, and let's fix some of those issues. I'm Joshua Delisle, the designer maker. Let me make your life just that little bit better. So the reason why these heaters work so well and are so cheap is because China has copied these directly from a company called Webasto. Webasto is a German-made company, and like anything German, they made them right. What I believe happened is that the patents, because this is a very old design, had run out and therefore China took on those patents and built their own. Now I claim to have four models of these, a two kilowatt, three kilowatt, five kilowatt and eight kilowatt. Now in reality, there are only two models. There is a small one and a slightly bigger one. And what they're rated to is depending on the pump on how much fuel can actually be forced into that burner system. And that's what they've spec their ratings at. However, so this one in particular is supposed to be eight kilowatts. So in the previous episode, we tested that. We put it into its maximum setting, 5.5 hertz, which is the pumping speed. We tested it for exactly one hour and then measured exactly how much fuel it used. And it used 350 milliliters of red diesel. And so I did all the pricing structure and stuff from that and that we worked out that if this was eight kilowatts, that's a fantastic price. Only 350 milliliters of diesel does not contain eight kilowatts of energy. It actually only contains three and a half kilowatts of energy. And if we assume that this isn't 100% efficient, it can't be because we're releasing quite a lot of heat out through the exhaust, it's probably actually only three kilowatts. So it was very important for me to correct that information with this new video, but we wouldn't have found that out unless I had tested it. And that's why the comment section is so important. If I have made a mistake or if there's any extra information, I will definitely pin it to the very top of the comment section for everyone to see. So do make sure you check all of those in my other videos. So probably your next question is, okay, so now that we've got that information, how much is it actually costing to run per kilowatt? So what we used previously was red diesel, more on the red diesel bit in a minute, but that cost pound thirty per litre. If we divide that by 1,000 millilitres and then times that number by 350 millilitres, that is what we used within an hour, then you get 45 pence. So if we divide the 45 pence by the three kilowatts, then we get 15 pence per kilowatt, which is still more than half the price of electricity. Electricity is 35 pence per kilowatt here in the UK. So when we use an electric heater, you're basically using exactly that. If you use a kilowatt of electricity to blow around your room, that is exactly 35 pence. So let's talk about red diesel. Apparently this year, you're not allowed to use red diesel for domestic heating. But what we can burn through this instead is kerosene. So here we go, here's some kerosene. No, it's not what it looks like. Now, kerosene and diesel are very, very similar. Diesel has about 9.5 to about 10 kilowatts of energy per litre. Kerosene has 10.3 kilowatts per litre. So kerosene is used as heating oil. It's, it's made for this. Now the prices have been going up and down uh, due to a certain conflict, but a current state today, uh, this uh, video was published, was about 80 pence per litre. So for a, a full on burn, that would have been about 28 pence. And so this works out to be 7.7 .7 pence per kilowatt, which is an excellent price considering that natural gas is 10 pence per kilowatt. And believe it or not, using an air source heat pump is nine pence per kilowatt. That's what I worked it out to be. 35 pence per kilowatt of electricity. Uh, you get a conversion of between one to four. So yeah, 8.75 pence per kilowatt that works out to be for an air source heat pump. And considering the systems can cost about £15,000 to put in, this is a no-brainer because that was about 120 quid. Anyway, we're going to modify this now and I'm also going to test another fuel as well, which you can get for free and is currently legal. So 
keep it quiet, otherwise they might ban that as well. Let's do the modifications first. Let's go for a deep look in here. This is as far as we got last time. So now, I'm gonna take all of this bit apart. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's the, uh, the turbo. But now we can get access to the glow plug, as you can see. Just a normal 13 mil spanner. So that's the glow plug after about 10 litres of fuel. I'm gonna have to remove the gasket. Right. Aha! Alright, so here's a place where you've got a bit better lighting. So that's the inside. Alright, so on the inside of there, there's like a little tiny mesh, and that's what the glow plug heats up and combusts all the fuel. I'm going to see if I can get that out, because it'd be good if we can see if we can actually clean it out or not. If we ruin it, I'll have to buy some more. You can actually buy those, which is really good. Ooh. Okay, so that was a little bit of effort, but you can see what I did. I kind of scrunched up the end and then pulled it out. I have damaged mine slightly, let's see if I can just repair it. Right, there you go. So if anything's gonna get clogged, it's gonna be this little mesh part here. Now you can replace these, or you can try and clean them out. I don't believe they're very expensive, so just having a nice big pack of these and then just ripping them out and popping new ones back in, I don't think it's a big issue. Now, depending on how clogged this gets, I might consider getting hold of an ultrasonic cleaner. That way I can just dunk this in and it'll clean it inside and out which is really good and this side looks really really clean there's hardly anything in there at all so here's the before and i'll show the after at the end of the video so quite a lot of people will be quite scared about taking something like this apart and uh, i blame the school system for that they don't teach you nothing practical but this is why i do these videos so i can show you guys how to do them and even better if i'm doing it wrong there's people even cleverer than me who comment on these videos. So hopefully, together, we all learn something. What am I doing? What is the plan? So some of the best advice I've been given is to replace this floppy, rubbery fuel line and give it some solid fuel line like this one. And if you need any of this stuff for yourselves, there will be links in the description and I'll try and keep them updated as well in case they run out. I've got some very affordable fuel filters as well. Now I've got an extra tank because we're gonna put some more viscous fuels in this one. And then to switch between the two fuels that I've got, we've got a fuel switch over valve. So this is good as well because it's got a little drain plug at the bottom and there's actually a little filter inside it as well. So the idea is we can get the heater up to temperature using our kerosene, and then we can switch to our alternative fuel after. So once I've fitted this, what I'll also be doing is making a heat exchanger for the exhaust. We're getting the maximum amount of heat from what we're putting in this thing. So I've decided to have the fuel line come straight out the back here. You can see it's gone through a hole that's already existing. Uh, but that's quite a sharp edge around that, so I'm just going to put a little grommet there. There you go, that's going to protect that nicely. And then I can put the filter on this end. So I want to put my fuel switch at the bottom here. So we just need to drill a little 6mm hole. And this fuel switch has a little threaded hole there, which is good. So that just simply slots there like that. Put my M6 bolt in. Yeah, that's fairly neat. So straight after the fuel switch, I want to put the pump. But I'm going to have the pump parallel. Now they do say to have it at 30 degrees, say, like this. And the idea, I believe, is to help the air bubbles escape and come out. Um, so if we just put it here, we can change the angle and see the results just like that. Now I could just use a nut and bolt here. That would be very simple. But because so many people were interested in the tool that I used before to mount it to my uh, shed, what I used is riv nuts. So as the name suggests, it's both a nut and a rivet and you have to use a special tool like this to use it. Now, I wouldn't say a riv nut is a needed tool. For me, I just thought it would be the best application for my tin shed. It's just a very neat fixing point is all. So I've brought some extra hose to couple these things together. All right, so I've skipped ahead here, but this is basically fuel line from tank number one, this is the fuel line from tank number two. We've got our fuel switch. That leads straight to the pump, and then from the pump, straight to the burner. Let's get the cover back on. So our next modification is to do with the exhaust and the air intake. Now I didn't think about it at the time, but it makes perfect sense to have the air intake come from the outside. The reason is because if we're taking air from inside, we're actually creating negative pressure. 
meaning cold air is now seeping in for all the cracks and crevices. So if it comes from the outside, we're not affecting the pressure inside the workshop or the, your space at all. And what I'm understanding now is that this isn't an air filter, so this isn't to stop particles. It might stop a few insects getting in, but it's actually for balancing so that the pressures are relatively equal, which should make it run better. However, what I've actually gone and done is bought some more exhaust. This was two meters long and it's gonna act as a heat exchanger. Now I know what some of you are thinking, there is too many bends in that so it won't work properly. Because I think what you're meant to have is up to a maximum of 490 degree bends. And not only that, but the exhaust will condense inside this if it's super cooled. So that means that there could be a buildup of an acidic liquid within this. But like I said, this is an experiment. So we're gonna try this and I've got some more exhaust as well. Now I won't be using waste oil. I will be using waste vegetable oil. Either, either way, whichever you're using, you want to kind of pre-filter that kind of a fuel first. So they recommend like going through a 10 micron filter and then a one micron filter after if you can. We're going to be testing the temperature and the flow rate of all the outputs here. I've got some more equipment on that. Oh yeah, in this bucket of water that I have in front of me, that's why I've designed the exhaust to be this shape. So what I can do, fill this with water and now that exhaust is going to heat all this water. This to me was the most simplest way. It's gonna extract quite a lot of energy out of that exhaust. And I can then use it to just radiate heat out slowly, like a thermal battery in a way. Or we could take that water and put it to some work, like have a shower or something, I don't know. So here's where I've mounted the secondary tank. You can see I've very simply fixed it on using three millimeter annealed wire. I've also installed the fuel filter down here and I've currently filled it with my alternative fuel. And finally, lots of people have asked about the power supply situation. So what I've chosen to do here is have a 300 watt 12 volt converter. So 240 volt comes in, 12 volt out, and it's rated to 300 watts. And the reason is the machine itself uses about 150 watts to get the glow plug started. Thereafter, it runs on about 40 watts. Now, lots of people have suggested using an old PC power transformer, that would work great. But actually, the best method isn't to use one of these at all. Instead, to use a 12 volt battery with either a mains power linked to it or a solar power charger linked to it. And the reason is that this must perform a cool down cycle. So if we had a power cut, and this shut off straight away, it could potentially damage the unit. Now, guaranteed right now, my Sparky friends will be commenting that I should have a cover on the thing. Because yes, 240 volt electricity is incredibly dangerous. And those connections are obviously quite exposed. Now, a few people said that I didn't put the cost of the electricity on this unit. The truth is all the information was there, but I'll show you how to calculate it yourselves. How you do it is you take your electrical standard rate, which is measured in kilowatts. So for us here in England, it's 35 pence per kilowatt. A kilowatt is a thousand watts. So if we divide the 35 pence by a thousand or whatever your rate is divided by a thousand, it runs at 150 watts for just one minute. So we'll ignore that and just do the running cost. So your rates divided by a thousand times 40, that gives you the price per hour, which for me works out to be one penny per hour. Okay then, I've filled it with kerosene, I've turned it on, we purged it using the same method that we did in the previous episode. It was a little bit smoky to start with, but it's running, so the setup's looking good. If we take a bit of a look with the thermal imaging camera, what we can see is it's about 170 degrees on that exhaust. So let's see if we can improve that efficiency by adding the bucket of water. And I'm gonna do this safely then. Ugh. There we are. So apparently you shouldn't really use thermal imaging cameras on shiny surfaces. So instead I've got some black stickers to stick on this and that way we should get a much more accurate readout. For everything else, I'll probably have to get some black paint. So I've also got a food thermometer as well. So we can put that in. Now that's registering the surface temperature, which says it's about 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah, and you can see there on the thermal imaging camera, that sticker is coming up a lot more clearer. That says 30 degrees on the top there, and at the bottom sticker is still only eight degrees. And just out of interest, I put another sticker there as well. So now we've got three points. Wow, I'm amazed how warm that has gotten already. Right, something's not quite sounding right, so I'm gonna stop it and we're gonna have a look inside this exhaust. It sounds like there's water inside it, by the sounds of it. 
shouldn't be though, it should be completely sealed. Hmm. Well, that didn't work. Now I did test this to see if it was watertight, but obviously it isn't. However, in that short period of testing, it did prove one thing. We can get hot water from this. Now, I think I will use my welding skills to now make a heat exchanger, one that is watertight. But what we'll do for now is we'll use another length of two meter exhaust. I don't want to keep bending this because this stuff's so thin, it's prone for cracking. In fact, it's probably because I've been bending it that we've ended up with a very fine crack. So as far as I'm concerned, this is probably scrap now. All right, let's try exhaust number two. This is how they come, like this. Now, if you use the official Webasto or the other branded ones, they'll probably be a lot better quality. Pressure test. Yeah, it's fine. Just take your time unraveling these, because it is really thin. There we are. Right, so I've got some brackets now to make for the exhaust. So again, we're using some annealed wire. So the benefit of this design is we can slip it over the exhaust and then as we bend it into position, it actually grips tight the exhaust like that. Super simple. And then what we'll do is we'll get some mesh to make a protective cover for it. So that literally took just one minute. There we are, we're done. If you're wondering what these clips are, by the way, they're sheet metal clips. I've used them to fix lots of things. Very handy. All right, so this should now act as a radiator. In fact, that's what quite a few people have done. They've actually got a physical radiator and attached the plumbing to that and then piped it out. And the good thing about having an actual radiator is that you can have a, a drain at the bottom. So if there is any moisture building up inside, that can come out. Now I've left this part here exposed on purpose. I think in the future, what we can do is wrap some copper pipe around here and use that as a heat exchanger to then boil some water. All right, come on in, let's do the official test. What I have here, is waste vegetable oil. I acquired this from a local fish and chippy and specifically this is soya bean oil. I don't think it's the environmentally friendly kind. I'm assuming it's just the cheapest oil that they could get hold of. And unfortunately, some people charge to take the oil away, which means a lot of people are then disposing it themselves. Or some companies are actually buying it back so you can buy it for say 10 pence a litre. So don't be surprised if you approach a fish and chip shop or a restaurant and say, can I get hold of some of your waste oil and they go, yeah, sure, it's 10 pence per litre. But if, you know, you're friendly enough and you know the right places, you can get it for free. So I've been filtering my waste vegetable oil. I've got a nine litre bucket. So underneath we have a coffee filter. I fixed it on there using just three millimetre annealed wire again. And that's been dripping slowly into this container here. And then to speed up production, I've been using the heat from the heater to heat up the oil and that's been making it flow a lot more better. However, this still takes a very long time. And so I would recommend using a pump of some sort and actually forcing it through a filter of some sort. Right, so we're gonna try and do a much fairer test now. We're gonna leave it again for exactly one hour. As you can see, Carl Pilkington is still not very happy. And also I'm not gonna be going in and out of the doors. I think some people weren't impressed with the way it heated up the workshop in the last video. But I have massive garage doors, so I'm gonna be sure not to open them for the duration of this test. All systems standing by. I have a decibel reader here also. You can see when I speak it registers about 71 decibels. Once was a ship that went to sea. The name of the ship was a belly of tea. That's the sound of the pump. It's starting to kick in now. And we're at four hertz on this one. And we're registering 63 decibels. And obviously that's right close. If I take this to the other side of the workshop, it will be a lot less. Right, so it's telling me that it's up to temperature up here. If I take a reading, that's saying 13.5 ms. I'm assuming that's meters per second at 49 degrees Celsius. And so we can calculate volume. And that is 70 millimeters diameter. Right, we've got 306 degrees Celsius, wow. 
after that paint is definitely picking up that heat register a lot better. So let's check the other end. I'm seeing about 140 degrees Celsius there. That's not too bad. We've extracted half of the energy out of it. Now I can say that when we did the uh, water cooling, it was cold when it was coming out. Like I could literally put my hand on the end of the exhaust and it was, it was just like a blow of air. And I'll see if I can measure the flow rate of the exhaust also so we can get a good calculation. Right, so the recommendation is not to have it on too high a hertz. Four hertz is actually the maximum you want to be pumping for vegetable oil. So I've got a timer now. If I turn the switch and we'll press go. Wow, that sounds different. It's almost quietened it. It's obviously a lot more viscous for the pump, but it's proper dead in the sound. So let's check here. Yeah, I've melted it. Well, that didn't help. So this is registering approximately 90 degrees Celsius, 89.9 it seems to be fixed at. So there you go, it's dropping below 60 the further you go away. It's really not very loud, but it's very hard to judge on a video, isn't it? Right, we've just gone past half an hour now, and Carl Pilkington on the uh, thermometer says it's about 20 degrees already. Still no problems, it's all sounding good, and no leak detected, which is also good. So a few people asked as well, can I smell anything? I've got a little bit of a cold, but to be honest, no, there isn't a strong smell at all. It smells warm, you know, like any radiator does when it heats up. And I can smell a bit of the residue of the oil, but that's just because it's out and about. But no, if you can smell fumes, that would be worrying. It's dark outside at the moment, but next time we start this up, we'll see if there's any smoke change on the outside. Two other questions there, maybe. Two and a half million views now, oh my goodness. Yes, on the uh, subject of carbon monoxide buildup, a few people said, oh, why can't we have them on the outside of the building? Um, the simple answer to that is you absolutely can. And yes, that is a lot safer. You've got to figure out a way of having a much bigger holes drilled through your wall as such, so you can get the ducting to go in through there. And you must protect it from the elements, obviously. However, having it inside, there is a great benefit of utilizing all of the waste heat that there is. That's why we've given it the extra long exhaust, so extracting as much heat from it as we can. The body itself will be radiating heat. And also, if you think about where it's ducting into your house, that little tiny bit of ducting is going to be radiating heat. So that could be a third, if not a quarter of the amount. So if you're paying for the fuel, you're literally chucking away a quarter or a third of the amount of your money. So ideally, we want to extract as much as we can. Even the little electric device, that's going to be radiating a little bit of heat also, and it's going to contribute to the room. How efficiently your space heats up depends entirely on the space itself, how well insulated it is, how big it is. So I mentioned before, this is six meters by three meters by two and a half meters tall, this workshop. And the calculations that are on the internet say you want at least two kilowatts of energy pumping in. So if this is releasing three and a half kilowatts of energy, because that's how how much diesel it would have been using depending on how much of that heat gets leaked outside will tell us how efficient it is so if the exhaust fumes is the same temperature as the air coming in that's 100 efficiency now unfortunately i destroyed the thing so we can't now measure the flow rate of the exhaust so the volume is obviously very important because if we can calculate how much energy is within the volume of exhaust and then we would know the exact percentage of the efficiency that it is free heat and fuel eh <gasps> Obviously, don't tell everyone, you know. You know, if too many people approach the restaurants for cooking oil, there won't be enough for all of us. And you can expect the prices to rise, and probably the government to ban it. Talking of banning, I made a comment about waste oil and how they burn it in the previous episode, and quite a few pointed out, hang on, Josh, that's not entirely true. Some institutions do recycle it. Into what and where can you get this recycled oil, I'd like to ask. So the people who do have permission to burn waste oil have very strict procedures to make sure that the emissions and the pollution is to a minimum. So they basically put a catalytic converter on it like any other car. Either way, I think the three and a half grand of getting that permission is extortionate. And from what I can tell, these actually pollute less than a diesel truck passing by. No one would want there to be excess pollution in their area so there's incentive there to get hold of the catalytic converters and monitor the output anyway like it kind of self governs as far as I'm concerned but still I think it's a very good discussion to have so do feel free to uh, comment your thoughts right one hour is about to pass and Carl is looking very happy at 21.8 degrees Celsius got roughly five minutes left when the time goes what I will do is switch over to the other fuel and I'm gonna let it run on kerosene for about 10 minutes or so 
just so it can purge out the line. I don't, I don't want the vegetable oil to be in the line, so when I start it next time, it'll start straight away on kerosene. I managed to shop around for kerosene as well, and I managed to get hold of 500 litres for still a very good price. If you're trying to get hold of kerosene, I recommend actually going to the dealer and filling up like a jerry can. They'll only deliver like a thousand litres or 500 litres if you're filling up a tank at home. So take a jerry can, go to the actual dealer depot, you can buy just a little bit from them. Or alternatively, you could just ask a friend who's got kerosene, see if you can buy like 20 litres from them or something. Or if you get enough of you together, you could buy as a cooperative. So you kind of fill up a big tank and then you all take a share. Four, three, two, one. Oh, other way. Come on, warm here. I can hear the pump again now. Let's pop that in here. Right, while it's running, let's go over exactly how much we've used. We've got 600 milliliters left, pretty much exactly. So surprisingly, we've used more, nearly 50 milliliters more. Now that could be to do with the new fuel line. Quite a number of people suggested that because it needs the correct pressure within the pipe to pump efficiently. So now that we've got a harder pipe, we're expecting to use more fuel, which therefore will increase the kilowatts per hour that this would use. Right, so let's calculate this. Vegetable oil is roughly 9.2 kilowatts per liter. So divided by a thousand, that's roughly 9.2 watts per milliliter, times that by 400, with 3,680 watts. So 3.6 kilowatts, that is. Oh no, I spilled a bit. There we go, I'd say we've got about three and a half liters at the moment. Right, it's frosty outside. Let me take you out and show you the exhaust situation. So very quickly, here's the air intake and I've put it going up high so it's directly under the eaves of the roof. And I've also turned the end down to stop rain getting in there. And here's the exhaust. I haven't covered it yet because there's not been any need to. It doesn't get hot enough. But to stop people passing along and knocking it, I will put something there eventually. Now the machine's off at the moment, but if I just show you one of my favorite features, it's got to be the radio remote. On days where it's particularly frosty, I can operate this straight from my house. And then by the time I come out with my brew, it's all nice and toasty inside. So let's just turn it on. I can hear it kicking in. And on the outside here, it's registering 62 decibels. So I'm gonna let it run for 10 minutes now, and then we'll switch the fuel over to waste vegetable oil, and we'll see if it's giving off any pollution. So I've been running it for a while on waste veg oil, and I've started noticing this. So it's at this point, clearly, most people will be put off using vegetable oil or waste oils, because this is excess pollution. We don't want that. But I've got another trick up my sleeve that we'll try and see if we can reduce that. So I've done my absolute best to get the vegetable oil to burn neat, but I'm not having much luck. There are settings that I'll show you in a second on how to adjust the air fuel mix ratio, but even that's not stopping the smoke and it's definitely getting worse. So I'm gonna try the next best thing and add 30% kerosene to the mix. So I'm currently only a third of a tank empty. If I mix the rest of the kerosene into that, we should get a fairly good mix ratio. Try and give it a bit of a stir if I can. Here we are, primed and ready. Let's try this out. Here we go, here's the result. This has been now running for about an hour on 30% kerosene to waste vegetable oil mix. And there's absolutely zero smoke coming from it. Now I have changed the air fuel mix ratio. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But to prove that it's burning efficiently, you can use the carbon monoxide detector on it. But if I hold that nice and close, I'm getting a maximum of 32 parts per million. That to me says it's burning really, really well. And the output heat, roughly 95 degrees Celsius. And the heat from the exhaust on the inside, 331 degrees Celsius. So if you're looking to change the air fuel mix also, what you need to do is press, press the spanner key here until we find the padlock. Then we press this button until we get one, press OK. The next one is six, OK, eight, eight this gives you these special settings. So the first one is your minimum pump speed. I've got mine to 1.2, press OK. The next is your maximum pump speed. I've got mine on four, OK. Now this is the fan speed, the minimum RPM I've got is 15 and the maximum I've got at 5000, which is the ultimate maximum that the fan speed will do. The voltage I've set to 12 volt, I believe you can set it to 24 volt here, depending on your system. 
SN is to do with the sensor. We've only got one, so we're going to stick with one. And the PF is the glow plug, and six is the highest setting, which I've got it on. Just note, if you're going to change yours at all, write it down what the original settings were before you do it. I cannot remember what mine were. I want this to run for at least another 10 hours, or at least until I've used all of that fuel mix. And if that's working as well as I hope it will, there's some massive savings to be made. So we have in fact passed the 10 hour mark and we've still got quite a bit of fuel left. This little mark here represents one litre that is left in the tank. So I think I'm gonna let it continue until it gets to this mark and then uh, we'll open it up. So it's starting to get dark now and we've already used 13 hours of burn time. As you can see, there's still no smoke, which is a really good sign. And there's probably just under a litre left before I wanna turn it off. So we're pretty much dead on the one litre mark now. And altogether, we did 14 and a half hours. Pretty much exactly 10 hours today and four and a half hours yesterday. So I'm gonna let it do its cool down cycle now and then we'll open it up. Right, here we go. It's not looking great, is it? Now it must be noted that in the test period, I was uh, abusing this thing. So I'd got the fuel mix completely wrong several times and where oil was actually coming out the exhaust. And when restarting it, you get all that horrible white smoke and everything. So it's all working fine now, but yeah, that won't look good. So what's interesting, doing the calculations, we've had far better fuel economy this time. I don't quite know why, because it would have been pumping at the same rate, but somehow we've used a lot less. So that tank holds about four and a half litres of fuel, and we used three and a half litres over a 14 and a half hour period. So apparently that's 241 millilitres per hour. So a third of the fuel is obviously kerosene. So if we take that into account, it costs roughly 26 pence per litre. So if we go by an estimate that is 10 kilowatts per litre in this, well that makes it out to be 2.6 pence per kilowatt. Now that is cheap heating. Not free, mind you, but it is cheap. Looking good so far. So glow plug's looking good. Let's see the burn chamber. Ooh, well, I don't think that's bad at all. I'm very surprised. I thought this would be a lot dirtier. All right, if we look at this side, that is a lot more dirtier. Whoops. Oh no, I just broke my gasket. Not to worry, I've got a replacement. You can actually get the packs and it came with a spare glow plug and a little gauze thing as well. Let's get this little gauze out. Well, there we go. That doesn't look too bad at all, actually. I'd say from the looks of it, it's good to keep going. It doesn't look clogged, it just looks discolored. So this part is obviously getting the hottest. So I think this is keeping clean because we're doing a pre and post burn using pure kerosene. I'm also turning the pump up for that. So we're going up to five and a half uh, hertz again and then I type the code in and drop it back down to four hertz which gives you the correct ratio for burning oil So there we are all still working great So obviously next I'd love to build that whole hot water system and create a more efficient way of filtering that waste vegetable oil But first I've got several more review videos to do and then I want to generate my own power using either a steam engine or Gasification all to look forward to if you subscribe if you want more information on this or anything else And please do let me know in the comment section until next time How about I recommend this video for you to watch and if not Why don't you guys get out there in the real world and forge for yourselves? a life worth living. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.